getting to the end of book one, which is really good timing. It's really good timing, because we'll start with book two soon, and we might even finish book two by Hanukkah. Because book three and book five are very, very difficult. So we are sort of going to... So we see <laughs> from the end piece that we did that the Kuzari is bringing a very interesting argument with regard to the message of, um, of God. And it's really a, a very interesting argument um, um, when we compare Judaism to other religions. The two competing religions believe that they are messages from God for all humanity. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Mm -hmm. And if so, says the, says the, the Kuzari, then there is something wrong when the message only gets delivered and accepted only by half of the people that were supposed to get the message. And he raises the question, isn't that a gum? Isn't that something wrong with the planning phase? So you would say, well, certainly the planning phase couldn't have been wrong. It's God. Okay, then it's God didn't make the mistake. So you want to say the prophet made a mistake? So we say, no, the prophet couldn't have made a mistake either. So then what's pshat? That's just not true. So we sort of are left with, we're stuck. So the, the, the rabbi says that God gave the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu to give it to the people who spoke the language of the Torah and he gave it to his own people and they, the purpose of this message was to give them the Torah and all of the prophets that come following are speaking about and to Israel Except including Israel. Jonah including. even Jonah because his whole um, um, message has to do with Eretz Israel and the people of Israel. So that's a longer conversation that we'll get into another time. So the Kuzari says, Wouldn't it have been better for God to just send the message of the Torah to all humanity, period? Have you ever thought about that? Like if Judaism is the truth, then why didn't God make everybody follow the truth? So he says, the rabbi says, wouldn't it have been better that all animals would be rational? Wouldn't it be better that all animals would be rational? Like you'd sit with your dog and play chess. Or the dog would be able to think and speak to you. Like, hey, you tell him, get off my couch. He says, it's not your couch. You didn't buy it. <laughs> Get up! <laughs> I say, yes, I did, and that would be the problem. What? The animals would take over. The animals would take over. Animal farm, right? <laughs> so, it makes them feel like they kill everyone else if they don't know the truth. And that would be God. <laughs> no. Bessie, Bessie I didn't give you, I'm giving <laughs> you, you have to remember, the answer is several premises. You can't take one premise and run with it. You have to wait. So he says, wouldn't it be better, wouldn't the world, life would be better that everybody, every being, would be rational? He says, if you're going to say yes, which people think about it and say, man, wouldn't that be nice if a fish could talk? It's like, get me out of here! Get me out of here! Get me out of here! Come on! Why is anything so this turtle is making me nervous. <laughs> He's looking at me funny. <laughs> and the turtle would say, you know, I can hear you. Shut up. No, you shut up. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> that would be better. See? That would be better. So he says, then that means you forgot what I already taught you about humanity. Which is what? that God connected to one human being, right? And he, that one human being receives the divine light. And the rest of the people 
are sort of like the outside shell. So what he's saying is we have, remember we said this, that there are multiple, there are different levels of existence. There's the existence of inanimate objects, tables, stones, right? Magnet. Then you have plants. Then, because what do plants do that, that stones don't? They grow. They, they and? Die. Grow and die. Okay, they also <laughs> reproduce. reproduce. Right? Stones so don't. Be my next thing. Right. If you put two stones together in a room, you could right? You a little stone if it cracks. But that, you're doing that. If you left two of them, one here and one here, turn off the lights, with a candle and very white music, you'd come back, you'd still see two stones this way, right? So we see that we go from inanimate objects to plants. What's after plants? Animals. Animals. What's after animals? Humans. What's after humans? Prophets. No, correct. Prophets. Good. So, and the Jewish people are all in the category of what? Prophets. Prophets. Wow! Mm. Right? So he's saying... You want everybody to be, the whole humanity to be at the level of prophets. It means that you want all, it's like wanting every living being to speak. There are different gradations in reality. Different levels of existence in reality. Prophets have a higher level. Correct. So that doesn't mean we're better. Just rather a different level. Yeah. But let's say, let's say it made us better. Let's just say I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that I think your, your first comment is absolutely right. Because saying like this, I am better than a washing machine. What's the comparison? Right? You're going to say you're better in what? What are you comparing? Right. Right? So to say... It's just different. It's different. Right? In, in what sense are we better? We are better to receive prophecy? Yes. Are we better in the we behave? No. Not necessarily. Yes. What about our inability to receive prophecy now? What about our ability to receive prophecy now? Um, Still there. Potentially. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's there. It's just God shut down the transmitter. But he turns it on and you tune into it. Boom. Or, that's one model. The other model is the transmitter is still transmitting, but we have reached such a low level that we can't pick up the transmission anymore. Every once in a while you get like a little, what was that? Do you hear that? And then they send you, they, they send you into, a, you know, to speak to somebody in a lab coat. Don't they say, I heard somewhere that, that some creep some rabbis explain deja vu as being like very minute okay. prophecy. Dreams. Right? And Yaakov when he leaves his his uh, Be'er Sheva and he has a dream. What does he see in a dream? A ladder. A ladder. He sees angels going up and down. Up and down. So we say that's Nevoah, that's prophecy. But I'm going to say we can't hold by dreams anymore. We don't hold by dreams. We don't hold by dreams. What does that mean? Have you ever seen uh, people uh, shake the lulav? Mm -hmm. What do they do with the lulav? Do you know? Oh, like, do they take just the lulav? No, and the estrog. They take, they take the just lulav and estrog, just two? No, they have the hadasa. And the hadasa and the right? They take all four and hold them together. Do you know that the way we learned that we have to do all four of them held together is based on a dream? Just look at the Shulchan Aruch. There's a, a, a rabbi in the Middle Ages. He wrote a parish on the Torah. It's called the Rekanati. And he says that he had a, an Ashkenazi rabbi visit him. And then he had a dream at night about this, this rabbi separating the lulav in the fort. And he like, he knew that that was wrong because it's like separating God's name, Yud Kei Vav Kei. And when he woke up, he's like, you have to do it together like this. 
<laughs> I mean, there is a whole, it's a whole sugya uh, of things that are, we do because of dream. It's not so simple. It's not so simple. Like Yaakov wrestled with an angel, correct? Mm-hmm. It was it in a dream or not? So on the side that it was a dream, that he dreamt that he wrestled with an angel, then why don't we eat the Gid Hanashe, the sciatic nerve or whatever it's called? In that dream. Because in the dream. He, in the dream. Correct. So to say, no, what, per, what kind of a person has a dream that he rests and then he wakes up with a wound? Right? I mean, people have dreams of that they get hit by a bus, but they wake up in the morning like they're fine. Do you imagine if you dreamt like, you know, somebody has to shalom dreamt, they, and then they, like, oh my God, why am I in my face? <laughs> you got hit by the bus. That's where they're in buns. What are you talking about? It doesn't work. So, he says, you have to understand that there are different types, different levels, and different levels is the reason why the Torah was given to the Jewish people. That's it. That's it. And he says something very interesting at the end. He says, you know that whoever met a prophet while he was receiving prophecy and he was speaking what God told him, then he, they would recognize that he is a different being than other human beings because of this. And he says, This is is really the difference between the Jewish people and the rest of the world. And the other difference is Olam the next world. Because what is the purpose of the next world? So he says, So why do we seek the world to come? And he says, for our soul to become divine that it would separate from its senses, that is bodily senses, and see the upper supernal realm, and hear the divine speech. And he says, that his, it would be the ultimate felicity, happiness, when it uh, reaches that level, and it would know that as, as when the body dies and withers, it will survive. So the Kuzari says, that's interesting that you talk about that. Because the other religions, when they talk about the world to come, they talk about, he calls it, he goes, Shmenim uchenim miudechem. They're fatter and tastier than your world. You get a buffet. All you can eat. What's your favorite food, Yitzchak? Sushi. Sushi. All you can eat sushi, remember now, you can eat in Gan Eden, some people say that you can eat whatever you want. So you can even have the funky sushi. I have a a friend that's a rabbi, he said, he said, you know, the first thing when I get to Gan Eden, yeah, so he says, when I get to Gan Eden, I'll ask for one thing, give me a razor. Just give me a razor, I just want one good shape. And I'm like, (laughs) cheese sticks, Never mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, no, I want this, I want that. So he says, all the other religions, the other religions promise these wonderful things in heaven. You can get food, you can get sensual pleasures, you can get all sorts of things. And what are you promising? You're going to connect with God, you're going to hear God speak. You're like, really? This is it? This is how you're going to sell this? Let me teach you about marketing. This is not, it's not going to sell very well. So the rabbi says, He says, all these things that they promise you that will come in the afterlife are based on things that are in this world. None of them exist in the future world. Do you understand what he's saying? Mm-hmm. He says, all the things that they promise you are of this world. 
and in the next world, none of these things exist. Kuzuri says, wait a minute. When I come to think about it, I don't see from other religions that everybody desires to die early. We, in the, we ended the discussion of a prophet, that a prophet talks about the world to come. And in Judaism, we describe the world to come as the soul being separated from the body and being connected to Hashem. Okay? So the king says to the rabbi, you know, the other religions promise us all sorts of wonderful things in the world to come. Golf courses, buffet, Las Vegas, right? All the good stuff. And you, what are you promising me? Like my body's going to wither away and my soul is just going to exist and connect with God? Like, what is that? What is that? So he says, what they are telling you about what is expected from what you're going to get in the world to come is everything that is in this world and nothing that is of the next world. So the king says, you know, come to think of it. Even though it sounds like so great, you know, the buffet, the golf course, the cruise. So says the king, if they promise all these physical pleasures, how come most people want to extend their life as much as possible? No matter how difficult their life is, they want to stay alive. If the world to come that they're promising is so good, why, every, why everybody's kind of like killing themselves? So the rabbi says, So he says something very interesting. But before we switch the topic, I want to sort of explain to you what is going on here. The Kuzari is arguing, making a very interesting argument. You have what Judaism teaches you about the world to come. And you have what the other religions teach about the world to come. What do we say about the world to come? You're going to burn, baby. No, no, sorry. (laughs) No, no, it doesn't say that. We say that it's spiritual. Correct, the neshama connects to Hashem. It might need to go and burn a little bit. Right? A little bit on the sides, you know, just a little. Make it a little crisp. And then, you know, to get a tan, you know, to look good for the beach, for the other uh, guy, you know. So it's all spiritual and it's all connecting to God. And the other religions are promising food and virgins and lots of physical pleasures. Okay? So the question is why? The Kuzari is saying the reason that they offer this is because that's the only experience they ever had is of physical pleasures. So they assume these physical pleasures continue in the world to come. But we go by our experience. We experience the world to come on Har Sinai. We know what it's like in the world to come because we've had it here. They didn't have it, so they imagine it's like here. We had it, what's over there, we had over here, so we know what's going to happen over there. That's why we're not arguing for, you know, uh, cream cheese uh, and bagels and lox with, uh, you know, cheesecake from Cheesecake Factory, the kosher one. under. Yeah, but that's, but that's Aida Haredi. There's one? Yeah. Where? 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 Yeah. Where? In heaven. Oh. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what? Where? Where? <laughs> I was like, let's get a trip going. All we have to do is not eat that. Wait, so they have burgers or cheese? Both. They have a mechum. It's divided in the middle. You go both ways. Now, this is what he's talking about. This is what really the issue is. The other religions promise something because you can only promise based on your own experience. Your experience is physical, so you say that continues in the next world. Our experience was as we experience what the world to come is going to be. We say, this is what it is. So the king says, but why don't you do what they do? He says, because they don't know what's happening over there. But we do. Because in Har Sinai, we recognize this. We had it. Okay. So 
He says, what are you going to say about someone who was present, experienced God in the angelic world? So the king says, I'm sure the person would seek to release his soul from his body and to connect to that light, and he would desire death. Right? He's applying the logic of, you know, that if this is such a great pleasure, then I would seek it now. But we know that that's not what's happening in Judaism. We don't say that. So the rabbi says, but the whole point of our existence is to connect to God. Correct? And when we connected was we understood that the only way to connect to God is through the mitzvahs. So that in order to connect to God, you have the mitzvot. So by wanting to end early, what would happen? You, you would cut yourself. Um, when you get to the other side, you correct, you get this modem, you know, the, the dial-in modem. Oh. You're like, you know, you know, you'd connect it, it's like, you know, one megabyte per hour, you know, right? Get off the phone. <laughs> right. right. It'd be like that. That is, the more mitzvahs, the better connection that you're going to have. So everyone wants the DSL or whatever the, you know, the fastest, you know, 144 gigabytes per second. Well, the only way to get that is mitzvahs. And to do mitzvahs, you have to be here. You have to have the opportunities to do the mitzvah. You have to be zarcher. So that's what the Kuzari is explaining to us with regard in answering why don't, you know, if it's such a great pleasure, why don't you all want to die? Because if we died, it would affect our connection. And so he says, when Hashem said, you shall be a nation unto me, and I will be your Lord, and I, I'll be your God, and I will lead you, right? And they saw that the angels came down, right, and connected to people, and Moshe Rabbeinu went up, right, to see the connection, and he says, he says, and we're going to put you in the Admat Kodesh. The, the, the land of Israel is going to also help you um, um, connect to me. And you will see, and you will be able to see my shechina, my presence connected to you. And you will know that because of all the things that are happening around you, they, they are sort of supernatural. Because you're defeating your enemies, your land is protected, everything is going well. And it sort of goes a little beyond what the natural world would necessarily produce. And he says, that would be a sign that all the promises that I made for you, you know, the connection is with you. So that it's not only that you need to commit to, to do the mitzvahs to get to the other side, but while you're here, you're connected to Hashem. Correct, it's not the same degree of connection or connectivity, but it's still connectivity. You're still connected. That's the point of the kuzari uh, here. And he says, and whoever reached this level of a connection to God through the mitzvah, through the Torah, he says, Lo will not fear death. Why? Because it's simply a continuation of his life. That is, he has a very close connection to Hashem. He's doing, you know, da, 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 and he's just not going to move to the other side. Right? He was in the waiting room, and now he enters to see the, you know, the king. There's no... So he says, and we see that the Torah speaks about this. And he says, and there's a mashal. So we have a parable. There were friends that were standing in the desert, or in the wilderness. Right? And one of them went to India. He loves talking about India. Yeah. Do you know why? No. It's the farthest outpost of sort of the known civilization. There are two sort of the farthest outposts. One is India, which is still considered civilized with the king, 
but it's sort of the exotic and you can use, because nobody knows too much about it. Or you can use Africa, but Africa is usually, we're talking about a non-ordered right. society. There's another frontier that is not really discussed in, uh, um, uh, in, in the Middle Ages, which is sort of uh, the Slavic countries. Because it's sort of, you know, I'm not sure what's going on there yet. Slavic. No, no, it's, it, the reason they're called Slavic, that's where they used to bring slaves from. Czech. And they would, bring them, they would bring them to Spain. And from Spain, they went all over the Near East. That's when the Muslims were uh, super in charge of Spain. And then once the Christians converted, and then you have the Slavs, those areas became Christian, then it sort of changed. And there were rules about Muslims and Jews owning slaves, but that's a non-Jewish slave, or non-Christian, I mean Christian slave. So the king goes to India, and he meets the, 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 the king, and he, the, this king, honors this guy, because he knows that he is of a, a very, very important uh, people, and that his ancestors, uh, and his ancestors were uh, close, and he gives, gives them, he gives this guy presents, and gifts, and he says, now go give it to your people in the wilderness. What's the parable about? So who's the friend, and who's the, who's the king of India? Hashem. Hashem. Hashem is the king of India, giving Moshe Rabbeinu all these gifts to go give to your people. Because I was, the king of India was close to the ancestors of these people in the desert. Okay, we'll stop here, and we'll finish the parable on um, Sunday. Sunday.